I want you all to picture a scene. Flashing lights, a sea of noisy yellow taxis, and dozens of languages ringing through the air. People from all backgrounds and all cultures in continuous motion, striving to achieve the one thing that matters most, the American dream. These are the sights and sounds many think of when they think of the immigrant story in America. But when my family immigrated to the United States from India, they were met by a completely different landscape. They heard the rumble of coal trains in southern West Virginia, and they saw the rolling Appalachian hills. The people around them looked different. They spoke a different language. They ate different food and they even wore different clothes. Nonetheless, they were eased into their new home by a place where a random act of kindness isn't so random, it's the standard. When my dad's uncle, Chandu Mama, first arrived at Montgomery Tech in Southern West Virginia, after an accidental detour in Montgomery, Alabama, he spent the majority of his small reserve of money to purchase a winter coat. And since the food in the dining hall was nothing like the food back home, and he had no money, he savored the same affordable meal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, bread and milk. And his arrival marked the beginning of my family's relationship with rural America. After Jandumama became an American citizen, he applied for green cards for his brothers, sisters, and their families. And after a decade of applying and waiting, their pathway to the United States was finally secured. Chandumama's two brothers arrived in the small town of Loris, South Carolina, a town of about 2,000 people. There they worked at construction sites, waving flags, and also by managing the finances of small businesses around town. And soon after, my grandmother, Chandumama's sister, and my grandfather arrived in Lewis. With a loan on a flight, a loan on the flight to the United States, and an eighth grade education, they sought any employment they could find. My grandfather worked at a factory hauling boxes. He poured concrete, and I remember him telling me that sometimes he would cry when a plane would go by because he just didn't have the money to visit home again. He also worked at several grocery stores, even bringing home expired free milk from Kroger because he knew it would last another few days. My grandmother, on the other hand, worked at a factory for 12 hours a day, sewing, sewing collars onto t-shirts, and even working overtime to put my dad through school back in India. After a while, they decided to pack up and try their luck in Cross Lanes, West Virginia, because why not? <laughs> That's where Chandu Mama was staying, and they were excited to try this new opportunity. And after working at a grocery store for a few more years and saving up enough money, they made a small down payment on the failing Hollywood Motel in Kanoa, West Virginia, a town of about 3,000 people. And I want you to picture this. It's a blinking Hollywood sign in the middle of southern West Virginia. One of the letters is missing, the lights aren't working, and that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> but within one year, the Hollywood Motel was at 110% occupancy. How is that even possible? <laughs> There's no one even living there. <laughs> but the truckers that would go through town in the middle of the night would always need to stop for a few hours for some rest. And my grandparents would stay up late into the night, clean the rooms themselves, change all the sheets, clean the bathrooms to make sure the hardworking truckers had a place to stay. And what they both quickly came to realize was that the community that they were now a part of wasn't so different as they had thought earlier. They both shared an eternal belief in the currencies of hard work, sweat, and most importantly, hospitality. This reminds me of a story my dad was telling me a few days ago of a neighbor of ours, an immigrant pediatrician named Dr. Verma. So Dr. Verma's toilet started overflowing in the middle of the night, around 2 a.m., and her disabled mother was unable to use the restroom. 
So ordinarily, there's no plumbers or plumbing companies that would be able to do anything about this at 2 a.m. A, a man named Alan, a guy who skins deer for hunters in the winter and works as a handyman for the rest of the year, raced over to their house, fixed the toilet in about two hours, and said, my son's pediatrician has nothing to worry about. I'm always going to be there. To me, that's exactly what community means. You know, we rely on each other. Someone's always there to help out. Like a few winters ago, after a winter storm, I was shoveling an office, and a man drives by in an ATV with a plow in the front of it and says, son, I got it, don't worry about it. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's the toughness of the coal miners, the hope of the striking teachers, and the bravery of the young men and women who serve our country that's always defined the character of West Virginia. But for several decades now, the state, as well as much of rural America, has felt the cold shoulder of a nation. That technology and modernization have no room for small town community values. But as President John F. Kennedy once said, the sun doesn't always shine in West Virginia, but the people always do. It's worth community, supersedes politics, where interdependence overpowers intolerance, and where my story is now interwoven with the fabric of the greater American promise, and where my family's story motivates me each and every day to give back to a country and a community that has given me so much more than I have ever been able to give it. I am who I am today, not despite of where I'm from, but because of where I'm from, West Virginia. And I hope that this story that I've shared with you today gives a small glimpse of the real immigrant story in rural America, a place that my family and I will forever be thankful for, and a place I will always call home, Country Roads Forever. Thank you.